Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to TOF Talks, a series of free conversations presented by the TOF in town in collaboration with the City of Melbourne's Melbourne Conversations. My name is Robin Healy. I'm the facilitator for this evening's conversation entitled Fashion More Than Runways and Frocks. I'm going to start tonight's conversation just with throwing out the premise which you probably read in the press release and then take that a little bit further. The conversation starts tonight with a question. Do fashion designers just make life more enjoyable, colourful, attractive and brands more profitable? As the fast fashion trends impacts, innovative designers are reinvigorating the tradition of the artisan, using innovative design and business thinking and working across a variety of creative disciplines. We all have personal, intimate associations with fashion and clothing. Fashion stands as a powerful social and cultural phenomenon. My connection to fashion is a long and intense one. Uh, currently, I'm working at RMIT. I am um, in the School of Fashion and Textiles, leading the research um, an innovation area. I previously worked as a program director at RMIT in the four-year fashion design degree, which gives me a fairly interesting insight into uh, fashion education and the idea of what a fashion designer might be. And we'll go back to that later on in this conversation. In another life, I was the senior curator at, the, at Fashion and Textiles at the National Gallery of Victoria. And before that, I was a senior curator at the National Gallery of Australia. So in my practice, I'm concerned with the activities of fashion, from design process, production and presentation. I do this through curation of exhibitions and sometimes through the role of provocateur and critic. My PhD was in the curation of fashion, explored how the museum expressed the everyday practices of fashion through the representation of the experience of wear and studied the subsequent death of fashion with the erosion of the new. So in developing tonight's conversation, I was concerned to engage with the nature of local practices. I think often we neglect what's in front of us. So I was interested to talk to three people, and I'll introduce those people in a moment, about what's happening in design, production and retail. Particularly interested in the potency of small enterprise, independent practitioners and enterprise, and what that does in shifting our understanding about fashion and the nature of fashion activities. And I use the word fashion in a very loose way. And again, we can talk about that later as we introduce the panellists and their particular practices. To set a context for the conversation tonight, I've thrown together just a few thoughts about fashion. Uh, just to set up a background. And as I say, tonight the focus will be really on the practitioners here tonight and the sorts of... The sorts of um, concerns that they have in the way they operate here in Melbourne. But I'll start off with Prof Professor Sandy Black from London College of Fashion. She reminds us that fashion and clothing are part of a universal experience. The textile and clothing industries occupying a powerful global position, both economically and in social cultural terms. Fashion is one of the few remaining craft-based industries relying on manual labour for manufacturing across a wide spectrum of practices, from artisanal to couture to mass production. Plus, there is also the increasing uptake of the use of digital technologies, changing the communication of fashion in design, making, retailing and marketing. So you can see there's a lot of things happening in terms of this, this fashion landscape. The fashion system and industry is as paradoxical as it is complex. Child labour, overproduction, consumption, Narrow, narrow ideals of beauty and environmental damage are just a few of the sensitive areas of concern. Tonight, we will discuss this very slippery category, uh, what it means to be a fashion designer, 
And for many people, they choose not to use the term fashion designer. For many people, they operate in and without fashion. And I think that's something that's interesting as we will, as the conversation evolves tonight. What does it mean to operate in today's contemporary fashion and textile industry? And tonight, a particular focus is looking at Melbourne uh, and to consider future roles, opportunities and challenges for creative practitioners and enterprise. I'm going to give a brief introduction to each of the panellists and then I'm going to make them introduce themselves in a much deeper fashion. So, starting off with my learned colleague here, yes, Mick Peel, who I work with, so I need to be incredibly um, <laughs> complimentary to him. Uh, Mick Peel is a senior lecturer in fashion design at RMIT University and founder of Busy Man Bicycles. Um, beside him, we have uh, Grace uh, McKilton. Uh, she is an art historian and curator and founder of The Social Studios. Right at the end there, we have Alastair McKinnon, who has an extensive experience in fashion going back 26 years. Is that correct? Yes, yes. 26 years. Um, he's director of Five Burrows and Orange Chairs. So you might note that all of us here tonight, none, not one of us would call ourselves a fashion designer. So that, I think, is interesting in itself. Uh, we are all educators in fashion design or operate, as I say, in this slippery, this slippery world known as fashion. So I'm going to start by asking Mick to share with us uh, his practice, to tell us a little bit about um, what he does at RMIT and also about his practice, Busy Man Bicycles. Mick, would you like to start? Sure. Thanks, Robin. Um, so, yeah, Busy Man Bicycles is something that I've been doing for about four years now. And basically what it is, is customising bicycle parts um, with leather work. So leather components for bicycles. Prim primarily that is bicycle saddles. So um, to a large degree, reupholstering bicycle saddles uh, directly for clients. So almost in a bespoke manner. Um, so I work directly with the client. I don't, re I don't wholesale to retailers. I don't sell through retailers. Uh, what I do at RMIT, I, as Robin said, lecture in fashion design. And my area of specialisation there is in the fashion design studio uh, and particularly in tailoring, menswear and uh, creative pattern cutting. Um, and I guess a, a bit of my background, I have prior to Busy Man Bicycles, I've worked uh, in the fashion industry with a couple of independent labels that I uh, had a part in establishing. And my, my, my role in those, those businesses was, was very much a hands-on uh, craft-based role, um, whether it was pattern cutting, or uh, constructing samples, right through to actually doing small-scale production. So my, my practice is very much concerned with making, um, and uh, it really defines what I do, actually physically making stuff. And to me, I think a lot of the design, as a design practitioner, I, I often refer to myself as a craftsman or craftsperson, to me, the design actually happens during that process of crafting, so designing through making. Uh, so that's, that's, I think that's pretty much who I am, what I do. Mick, do you want to show us some of your artwork? Sure, I've, I've brought along <laughs> a, a couple of samples of my work. Um, uh, we had a little conversation late last week and and it was suggested that I bring along some, some examples of what I'm working on at the moment, which was a little bit difficult because jobs come in and, and immediately they go out. As soon as I finish something, it, goes, it, it gets sent back off to the, to the client. Um, so I, I, I said to Grace, um, or to Bianca actually, uh, well, we'll see what I'm working on this weekend. So this will get sent out tomorrow. Um, so um, custom recovered bicycle saddles. Do you want to pass those around? <laughs> um, 
and I pulled an old one off my bike. So it's all um, primarily using leather. For the saddles, I use kangaroo leather, which has quite a, a nice um, selling point, apart from the fact that it's a beautiful material to work with. Um, and uh, it's highly durable. Uh, my customers in the US really like the idea of having a kangaroo-covered saddle. Um, I'm also dabbling a little bit in trying to get back into the garments. This is just a jacket that I'm working on for another client, uh, a client who I built a bicycle for. I made him a leather bag. He's an interior designer, so an interior designer-specific bag. Um, and now this is his jacket for riding his bicycle. Mick, do you want to stand up and show us your jacket? All right, I'll stand up and show my jacket. <laughs> um, this, this jacket has flexible back action panels, which I retrofit to a Savers jacket. I got the jacket from Savers and really it was a, a really nice jacket. I loved wearing it, became quite connected with it. And the lining started to fall apart. So I thought, um, I think I need to put a new lining in this, but in the process I'll, I'll modify the jacket and, and add this, this flex to the back shoulders so that when I'm riding my bike, um, the, the back expands um, and there's internal stretch mechanisms that help it recover back to its, its proper form, its proper tailored form. Thanks, Mick. Okay, Grace, can we hear from you? Uh, hi, everyone. It's a very romantic setting tonight. <laughs> Thanks for coming down. Um, so I'm definitely not a fashion designer. Um, I don't design anything at the social studio, um, but I'm very lucky to work with a very talented group of designers and makers, and similar to Mick, um, our process of design really starts with making, and that's very important at the studio for a number of reasons. Um, our traditional idea of a designer is um, someone very talented who goes to university and gets a qualification in fashion design and has a certain element of genius and talent and who then forges out this solo career where they become the hero designer and we all know the clothing by the name of that individual. Unfortunately, that process excludes an enormous number of people who for various reasons may not be able to get into that university degree or who may not see themselves as geniuses or um, understand that their practice of making is necessarily an individual thing as opposed to being a collective or a community activity. So at the social studio, we try not to privilege the idea of an individual designer, and instead we work collaboratively. Um, our team share ideas, um, and they develop their designs by trying things on and, um, you know, sh uh, I guess, sharing their thoughts on what works and what doesn't and their inspirations and bringing in ideas that might be very old, very traditional, um, and then thinking about ways that they can be made new again or just shared to a wider audience. Um, so it's a very unconventional model of fashion design, um, but the results speak for themselves. Every time you walk into the store, you'll find very unique, one-off individual pieces. And I think one of the nicest stories about the social studio is that we only use reclaimed fabrics, which means that, again, we challenge this idea of dreaming up the perfect or ideal garment and then making it from scratch. And instead, we start with the materials that we have and that becomes the basis of our design. Um, my background is in the creative arts. Um, I've, I was an artist. Um, my academic research looked at artists who use design to challenge consumer culture um, and those things certainly influence my practice today. <laughs> um, and I've brought a few things in to show you from the social studio, all of which I'm wearing. Uh, it's a few layers, so this isn't a strip show, <laughs> but I'll show you a few pieces. Is from, uh, this scarf is from the studio's new digital fabric printing enterprise, uh, designed by one of our students called Tabby. Um, 
and we just launched this enterprise about a month ago. Uh, this jacket is a kimono <laughs> style um, cardigan slash jacket made out of reclaimed fabric. And this is the, um, the racy part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this shirt as well is um, a social studio piece made out of reclaimed fabrics. Most of these pieces can't be recreated, they're one off. We only had a limited amount of fabric, um, and that's part of their charm. Thank you, Grace. Okay, Alistair, over to you. Uh, my practice now is mostly in retail. So um, I run Five Boroughs, which is at 345 Ligon Street, and it's been a home for the work of many local craftspeople. Um, I'm also a partner in Melbourne Alia, which some of you might know. It began in Christmas of 2011, popping up in four places in the city. Um, and again, it was to profile the work of Melbourne made and designed products. Behind that, I have a consultancy called Orange Chairs. And Orange Chairs uh, is there to assist companies to communicate uh, what they do and to also design products around their existing um, competencies. So the most obvious example I would point to of the work I've done with Orange Chairs is through the knitwear label Otto and Spike. So if you've bought a woolen scarf over the last five or six years, it may be one of those. Um, the, it was really a project with, or it is a project with a family who'd been knitting in Brunswick for 40 years and had never had a brand of their own. So they had worked for large companies like Nike, Adidas, Quicksilver, Rip Curl, Country Road over the years, and uh, had realised that um, that they could never retain those contracts. So no matter how well they served, um, no, how to, no matter how cheaply they delivered, they would always lose out in the end because there'd be a change of management at a line manager's role or someone would say, look, we should send those scarves and beanies over to Pakistan with the rest of the jumpers. So they would lose out in the end. And so they realised that to survive, they really needed to have a brand of their own. And so they'd known me for about 15 years and had watched the transition in my career from designer to marketer. And they said, look, could you write us a strategy about having a brand of our own? I delivered the strategy after about a month and they said, gee, it's great, can you start tomorrow? And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, we know we want a product but we don't have the time to do it. So we figure that you probably do. And it's like, oh, okay. So it took me a year to come up with the first collection because it was a long time since I'd actually designed anything as a job and, um, and I'd never really been exposed to um, using knitwear computers and a lot of their, their, a lot of their technology at the, at the time dated back to the 1980s and was very slow and very difficult to use. So anyway, we pushed out one collection and you know, we took it around and gradually its uh, presence grew and grew and that's, um, you know, and so we've, they ended up with a, with a label that uh, not only utilises their skills but also their collection of yarn. So over a 40 year period when everyone else was going out of business they were buying off the lots of yarn from these people at, at really great prices and they had this fantastic um, storehouse of warehouse actually of woolen yarns that had been purchased from either manufacturers who'd gone out of business or from um, manufacturers of yarn who uh, had had collections available for sale and um, you know they ended up with a lot bits. So my job as a designer was to create a label out of this yarn that was had very finite amounts of. So if we ran out of one red, we'd have to change to another one. And and uh, and they didn't want to spend any money on it because one of the reasons why they'd been successful and, made, and managed to stay in business for 40 years was purely through thrift. So <laughs> my job was to create this fantastic brand presence. And the only you know bits that I could outsource were some graphic design and some web building and the rest I had to kind of come up with from whatever I could find. So it was a fantastic challenge to kind of develop a label on their terms which is really unusual for a designer to be given such a, a difficult task. So I spent five years developing it and then at the end of, uh, the beginning of 2012 they said, I think we, we think we can take it on now. So I count that as a success that they were able to then, they've now continued on, this is their first season without my design input or any other input whatsoever. So luckily for me, um, at the end of that period, a store that had been really instrumental in um, uh, changing the face of or 
not changing the face, but determining the distribution strategy that we use for Otto and Spike, five boroughs, which was the closest store geographically to their factory and had always been like our factory store. The people who owned it said that they, you know, didn't want to own it anymore and was I interested in buying it. So, and they wanted someone who understood the footprint that they'd created and da 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 da. So there I find myself as a retailer. Originally I started out as a fashion designer, 20, what did I start in 1985? I think my first collection came out and I lasted a couple of years. I was a classic young designer. I didn't want to do anything else but make my stuff and I ran out of money after two years and had to find another way to keep myself in the industry. So I did everything from production management to sales and so that's where my intro introduction to marketing came and then after so many years of marketing fashion I realised it was the same message but it just had a different name on it. So I wanted to try marketing in a broader um, environment and thus I started the consultancy. And what am I wearing for, to do with uh, <laughs> what I do? Yeah, what are you wearing? Um, <laughs> this is a scarf. Um, actually, it's probably no better off me than it is on me. Um, it's from... And what it actually does is kind of encapsulate um, my career. It's by... <laughs> yes, Mike? My career is made up of images of the southern sky with cicadas in it. Um, it's actually from a designer called Bruce Lorick, who uh, was originally in Melbourne in the 80s and was hugely um, influential on me even getting a start. I just thought his work was marvellous. And he's in collections all around Australia and overseas and he sold his work, he and his partner Sarah Thorne sold their work both nationally and, in and internationally at the time. He worked for probably another 20 years after he, 15 years after he left the fashion industry and then decided after all this time of creating identities and other graphic devices that he just wanted to make a product again. He just wanted to get his hands in and make something. So this is his first attempt at getting back out there and making a product. So he's doing beautiful silk cotton scarves and homewares and I'm really proud to have them in my store because I understand the the strength of talent that goes into every one of those pieces and they're all, despite all the movements in technology, these are all hand-drawn. Mm. Mm. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. So look, I, I might go back to you, Alistair, and just um, how do you think the fashion industry has changed over the last sort of 10, 15 years? We won't go all the way back. But oh, 10, no, please 15. don't. Yeah. Um, I, I think... The biggest change to come to the industry, which is the biggest change that's come to rest of so the rest of society, is just our access to information and the speed at which information can be delivered from one place to another. Um, and the access to markets that designers have that they didn't have before. So now a designer can immediately put product on Etsy, they can have their own website quite cheaply, and then they can also participate in the whole market system of taking product out. So that never existed before. When I started, you had to take your collections out and sell them to a store, which is a really frightening experience. And you don't have some of that now, which is great because people can get access to consumers and get, a f get feedback on what they're doing. But the other more important thing that back ends all of that is, is the internet. So the idea of trend and information is being imparted so quickly that it has a really big impact on, on what we understand fashion to be and, and, and it has, has played a big role in the development of fast fashion because it's that, the accelerated idea of, of, of um, trend information that back ends fast fashion. So to me, they're the big changes. Mm. I might pick up... Um all of you on production. I think it's interesting even just looking at your scarves <laughs> and going across some of the things you're saying about the sorts of um, production techniques and Mick with you yourself in terms of going to a very labour intensive way of uh, working. Uh, Grace in terms of the printing technology. Do, do you want to comment on uh, producing in terms of um, the pressures on a, a small independent practice in terms of being able to be in control of production and the challenges that actually um, that actually um, presents to you. Um, so just before we were talking a little bit about um, small scale industry, and so we've launched this digital print studio, which is really exciting. But we're one of the only businesses now in Melbourne that do what we do. And that means that we don't have the support in terms of technicians and infrastructure when things go wrong. Um, and that's, you know, part of the challenge of, you know, maintaining this industry locally is mm. 
being prepared to take on all of the extra responsibilities. So our tech, I mean, our operator has to be a designer and a mechanic and a technician and a teacher mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and all of those things at the same time. But, you know, there's also potential that over time the industry will grow and that, you know, the benefits will pay off later on down the track. Mm. With, um, with, with, with my practice, um, I, I work out of a small studio in the back of my house. It's the back room of the house in Carlton. And, and I do everything myself. Um, and I, I quite like that scale of things um, where I'm basically, per, you know, I'm, I'm not able to do a production run as such um, or I don't outsource production. Um, everything is basically hand done by myself. Even all of the sewing is done with a needle and thread stitched by hand. Um, uh, and I, the, the, the work that I do is kind of limited by the technique and the or limited by the materials and techniques that I have at hand. Uh, though part of what I do is, is I try to help realise the vision that my customers have for their bicycle. Um, and um, sometimes that brings on a challenge for developing new technique, um, uh, but which, which might sometimes mean outsource, like trying to outsource certain um, applications of machinery or something like that. Um, but the, the small scale, there's something about the small scale that, that has a certain charm about it and it certainly appeals to the, the client. Um, you know, I have clients from across the world and, um, you know, they, they know about me through the internet. It all kind of happened by accident. Um, it's just happened organically. Uh, but they, they like that personal contact and sometimes they want more than the internet. They want to come around to my lounge room and have a chat or if they live in, in London, they want my phone number so they can call me up. Um, but, yeah, I think um, small scale is working for me. I've seen production at all levels as a production manager and then as a maker of product. So I've been like Mick where I've made things by hand in a small studio and there's a, there is a beautiful charm and, and uh, a sort of really restive quality to making things like that and learning how to do, you know, hand-stitched mm, uh, keyhole buttons from my sister-in-law who'd, you know, been to Emily Mack in the day and all that sort of thing and, and through to, you know, going to a factory and trying to figure out how best to use their skills. Um, and I find all of those things really fascinating and interesting and, and you know, one of the things that keeps you involved. Um, I, with the knitwear consultancy, it was a really interesting, um, you know, to be involved at that level where they... Th it's an industry where there's a... A declining number of people who have those skills as technicians or machine operators or final, you know, people who can do the, the hand finishing at the end. So we were just discussing before about, you know, keeping certain machinery that, you know, from from a sensible accounting point of view, maybe should be gotten rid of. But there are certain there are certain things that those machines can create. But for them to be able to create, there are, you know, people always will say to you, oh, is that hand knitted? And you know, it's actually knitted on a machine. It's like, oh, OK. So it's not really as good as I thought it was. But, you know, it's actually not like that at all because a machine doesn't do things by itself. It does, but it's limited to, you know, it can't move the piece from where it is to where it needs to be and all those obvious things. But, but, but it doesn't actually create... It creates a semi-finished object. And so the further back you go with machinery, the more human interplay is required, the more hands are required, the more skilled hands are required. And I think one of the things I loved about working in that factory is that there, were, there are women still there in their 60s who there would be no Otto and Spike if it weren't for those women. And there's, there's you know, the guy who m manages most of the machines is nearly 70 and, and it's the same if it wasn't for Les, there'd be no Otto and Spike. So, you know, it isn't to say that machines do everything, people have an incredibly important role to play and it's really important that we have the, the facilities for people to, to be trained on going so that the, those products and skills can, can uh, be passed on. I think we go back to fashion being very, a very complex 
industry and system. So artisanal practice offers a particular approach and access to a particular set of people. So I think this is also throwing open perhaps thinking about in terms of local practices, the identity of Melbourne as a fashion centre, is it established through these small independent practices or, or is it a combination of a whole range of different things? I mean, we often talk about Melbourne as this, this fashion centre um, we can talk about the debate between Melbourne and Sydney, but we could get on with that later. So what, what is it about Melbourne as this fashion centre? Often, I know from my own experience at RMIT, we talk about these small independent practices. Again, you've alluded, Alastair, to the to issues with being a sustainable independent practice. It's all very well having this image that we can have all these people with independent practices, but at the end of the day, people need to make a livelihood and so on. Um, also in terms of quantity, in terms of what you need to do, like Mick has alluded to the strains of <laughs> keeping up with the saddles. Robert, um, I, think, I think that image of Melbourne as a fashion centre, you know, you can look at it uh, historically as a simply a fact that just a, the majority of Australian manufacturing happened in Melbourne. I can't mm -hmm. remember what the figure was at the end mm -hmm. of the 80s, but it's astonishing. Mm -hmm. It's like... Yes. 80, 20 or something right. of, of that nature. And of that, more than almost almost half of that was, was textile manufacturing. Exactly. So, you know, on, on, simply on a, on, on a weight of numbers, that's why Melbourne was a fashion centre because that's where most of it was made. And then I think you've also got the whole style aspect of Melbourne, people mm -hmm. taking clothing seriously and a lot of that's got to do with environment and temperature and climate. Mm -hmm. So there are reasons why... Um, that that moniker has been stuck on Melbourne, um, and and we, and you know because of uh, of that climate, you know people tend to use more complex layers of clothing as a, as as a means of self expression. I mean, if you in a tropical environment, you, you've got less options for how you you can you know, you don't have you don't have the options in, in layers to express yourself with clothing. But do you think do you think there's the same culture of these artisanal practices in Sydney as we have in Melbourne? Uh, no, I, I think Sydney has always operated in a slightly different way, where you needed you to really make yourself known in Sydney. You kind of have to you have to break through at a, at a higher level because there's so mm. much marketing noise in a, in a in a big city like Sydney. So it's it's very hard to be an artisanal maker in a, in, a, in a city like that, you need to you need to rise above for people to see you to to get your name out there. Mm. Um, I think it's it's a really it's a really difficult aspect of of, of, of that kind of practice in in, in Sydney. Mm. So might that mean like participating to a large degree in that marketing noise? Do you think, Alistair? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, you know, you have to be able to, you know, have a volume similar to those ones around you. And so perhaps there's a loss of intensity around the product or the design input because a lot of your energy is going into just projecting yourself into, into the marketplace. From a logistics point of view as well, there's a lot of cultural hubs that are not in the CBD in Melbourne, mm -hmm. and that means lower rents, which means it's more accessible for makers mm -hmm. and designers to set up mm -hmm. shops, and Melbourne people are prepared to go off the beaten track and go down side streets to find things that are different or unusual in some ways. So there's, there is that element of access in Melbourne. That's or certainly was. true of the store that I've taken over five boroughs. I mean, it was set up because Brunswick was a low rent area and people went into very small manufacturing spaces and set up studios. And of course, that's all turned around now. It's becoming very gentrified. Mm. But, mm. you know, the premise behind that store was to support the work of the people who started it and the people around them. So, you know, it's very true. Mm -hmm. um, just, just going back to my practice um, and this idea of making a, a living out of it, um, and being able to produce enough work. Um, and, and the fact that I've ended up doing leather work for bikes instead of jackets or a, a fashion clothing line. Um, I don't know, I'm kind of interested in the idea of how, whether I could apply that, the model that I've developed with the bicycle stuff, whether I could actually apply that to a clothing collection or a, or a way of developing and making clothing and actually um, make a living out of it as well. It's something that I, I haven't tested, um, but it'd be interesting to see if, if I could. 
I think one of the biggest barriers is consumer awareness about the cost of making. And that's why it's so difficult for start-up fashion labels that produce in local, locally in Melbourne to get very far because consumers don't understand how much time it takes to make that one garment. And if you pay someone properly for each hour that they've spent making that garment, what that does to the cost of the finished product. Yeah, I think that's why I've actually moved away from the garment because just just to make one jacket, there's so many hours of work, like it's so labour intensive. And Robin described my saddle work as labour intensive, but it's nothing on, on mm. doing, like tailoring a jacket. Um, so partly I don't have that, I've got a short concentration span, mm -hmm. so I need to get that <laughs> job started and finished. Um, but, but partly that people, yeah, people won't want to pay for that labour intensive work. I think, I think people want to, I think a lot of people want to do good with their money when they buy something, but I think when they're actually um, presented with the, the article and the price, it's very difficult for them to draw a distinction between something that costs a third of the, of, of the handmade piece and the handmade piece that they're looking at, as much as they really would like to follow that handmade piece and support locally made, um, it's very difficult. Everyone has money pressures of one kind or another. That's, so That's not just people, that's us as well. Well, of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't stand outside that, yeah. <laughs> but I think, interestingly, this is, a, this, is a, this is something that's happening all around the world. I did a little bit of travel after Christmas and everywhere I went, there was a push for, you know, this is made in this area and this is made nearby and, you know, there seems to be at a certain level there's a real interest in bringing things back into or having things made back in places that they've always been made and sort of reconnecting with those traditions. Mm. So bring it back to the local practices. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And that, that's really what we were trying to talk about tonight was to get into some of the types of local practices that we have here in Melbourne. But Mick, I wanted to come back to you as well in terms of thinking about teaching at RMIT. H how have you noticed that's changed? in terms of students and their expectations when they enter into a fashion design program? Uh, I mean, they're, they're still entering into the fashion design program um, with the plan that they're going to be, um, you know, big famous designers, I think, to a large degree. Um, look, um, it's, it's difficult to know what their expectations are exactly, but they certainly change through the throughout the duration of the program. Um, I mean, in my own teaching, I, I teach based on my own um, philosophy of designing and making. So what I teach is, is making and designing through making. Um, and, you know, some students will really um, get their claws into that and some of them it, it won't appeal to whatsoever. Um, it's how how has the how how have their um, expectations changed over the years? I don't know. To a large degree, they they're kind of similar. Mm. I think um, certainly as fresh students, um, but I, I think they're leaving with with a really good grounded um, view of what the, the the landscape of 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 fashion and the fashion industry. Um, that, that they're going to occupy and hopefully shape in the future. I think the problem with that is that the incoming students' idea of what fashion is is basically driven by media examples of what fashion is and I think it's a really unfortunate misrepresentation of what fashion can be. There's some, you know, fashion is populated by some highly intelligent, worldly people who understand the context in which they're creating clothes in, um, the you know, that's cultural and economic, it's, you know, these are, these are really broad thinkers who apply mm. all of that into this design discipline and I think, I'm, you know, the fact that we focus on, you know, cup frocks or, you know, David Jones parade or something is, is a really, is a really, a, a really great disservice to, to the intellect that goes into the clothes that we wear. Mm. I, th I think that's, that's a difference between craft person and crafty. <laughs> so crafty, 
<laughs> or crafts, maybe crafts rather than craft, um, crafty. You know, things like um, magenta and turquoise silk painting, that kind of thing, um, is sort of like um, crafts. I, um, the way that, that craft or crafts people um, or finely crafted, I mean, the word can mean so many things can mean so many different things or can have be so misused kind of connotations yeah um, and it's used in marketing you know to describe um, you know well engineered machines um, uh, but um, I mean it, it's it's I think I mean the way that I'm talking about it is is a lot to do with materials and tradition um, but, but then sort of like extend... From a marketing them. perspective, artisan probably comes over better than craftsperson. I think craftsperson has unfortunately has some um, unhealthy hangovers from the 70s. Okay, I'm going to come in and totally disagree. I mean, in the last 10 years, the word craft has totally changed in terms of an understanding. I mean, if you want to... There's a fantastic exhibition that was held at the Victoria and Albert Museum a couple of years ago, The Power of Making. Um, you know, the banner of the craftsman... You know, the craftsperson has become a very potent one, especially in an environment where uh, we're losing sense of the very act of production itself and also recognition that it is incredibly challenging to get to a certain level where you can do these incredible things. So in the exhibition at the um, Victoria and Albert Museum, they had people that made glass eyes alongside people that did exquisite embroidery. Um, you actually got a real sense of the potency of what craft might be. So, so I, I think in terms of it's really when you look at marketing, it's how you put that out there. Um, and I think if you, if, you, if you bear the banner proudly, um, it's like being a fashion designer. Um, I know in my role at RMIT, uh, when, when um, students leave, they do. They, they have a conviction of what that is. It's all very different because that's part of what they learn at RMIT is what that means to them. So there is no generic understanding of what that might be. So I think when you look at something like craft, I think it is something you put out there and the shift has been enormous. If you go to Craft Victoria and you look at the sorts of people operating there and selling their, their, their works through Craft Victoria and the sorts of exhibitions put out through Craft Victoria, they're probably some of the most ad adventurous exhibitions you'll find in Melbourne and that's under the banner of craft. So. I really think craft is a really very potent one. And fashion has always had craft in it. And I think it's really great to see people using the word again. So if you're worried about using the word craft, I would actually say go for it. There you go. I think, I think <laughs> part, part of um, one thing that I've been concerned about is this removal of the process of making and crafting um, and, and that hand making skill from our industry with. Um, you know, with the advent of, of offshore manufacturing and so on, a lot of our skilled people, or the, the base of skilled people is diminishing. Um, uh, so I, I mean, that's, that's just one thing that, that's concerned me about the industry. I've seen a real shift with Melbourne designers um, introducing a bit more custom and make to order in their practice so that they can engage more directly with the customer. Um, and I think that's probably a response to online. So it's easy to get things that are quite generic online. It's harder to get something that's quite unique and special. Um, and I think a, in particular in Melbourne, a lot of designers are really taking this up in some wonderful ways. Um, one of the great things about um, the social studio is that our manufacturing and our retail space are the one space. So we have this direct exchange between our makers and our consumers. So we have the ability to adjust things if they're not quite right. We have the ability to show other fabrics if a customer wants to get it in a different fabric or a different colour or a different um, weight of fabric. Um, and I think that's making that retail experience a lot more engaging for the customer and enabling them to connect with the garment more is partly a response to the kind of overwhelming success of online. That's my... Retail has to be an experience beyond the product. You know, it's got to be something that... It's got to be theatre and it's got to be um, full of stories and have lots of touch points for people to go into it. And, you know, if you've got... You know, if you've got retail working, then, you know, online can be a beautiful, 
you know, in tandem with that. But it certainly has to be, um, it certainly has, certainly has to be um, a, an engaging experience that, that goes beyond the product. So, you know, it's, a, it's, it's something where there's, you've got to be constantly vigilant about how you're presenting things and, you know, making sure that you're thinking about what it's like to be on the other side of the counter. It's not enough to just put the product out there and stand and hope that, you know, people are going to appreciate that. You really have to keep addressing their needs all the time. And if you don't do that, then, yeah, you probably, you probably do have a problem. And that online can be, could possibly take over as an experience if you don't do it right. depends who the retailer is. I think there are people who, there are always people who do their job well. Um, I mean, there are some big stores that don't do it well and that's the reason because they're hoping that by just plonking out those brands and those names in front of people that that's going to be enough. You know, they're saying, oh, look, you know, we're having a terrible time so we can't really probably afford to make it a much more engaging experience. We've got to have less staff and, you know, we're not, we're going to have really bland windows and, you know, so... It sort of they create the 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 hole that they've fallen in, or they deepen the hole they've fallen in. So yeah, look, there are, there are people who aren't doing it well, and they're probably the people that are screaming the loudest. Um, and then there are other people, and usually on the smaller side of things, who are who are um, who are doing a great job, that are making you know shopping a really fantastic experience. I don't know that there are machinist. Well, Cost we, training machine. We deliver um, certificate <coughs> two and three in clothing production. Oh, there you go. Um, so there are courses, but it's mostly industry focused. So it will often be apprenticeships and traineeships in industry, so in manufacturing spaces. Um, and it's very focused on those practical skills. Unfortunately, there's been a big decline in the take-up of that course um, and all, simultaneously a decline in people with those skills. So a lot of people are retiring with those incredible sampling and machining skills. Um, but at the same time, there's a commitment to manufacture in Australia and there's potential there. So um, we were told recently that we're training more people in clothing production at the social studio than anywhere else in Victoria. <laughs> so we're happy to fly the flag and um, to continue to try to support that, that skill base. The, the, the skilled and that, people. And that's, and that's done through RMIT, RMIT Brunswick. Yeah. So Brunswick Campus does that. So we also offer courses in footwear and other types of production. So there is that, but again, it's demand. It's actually getting people to actually want to do those courses. So that's something we are looking at in terms of how we put those out there and the opportunities that those courses actually present. Because a part of that is the knowledge of them and then what you can do once you have that qualification. So what sort of career opportunities exactly. are there? Exactly, what you can do once yeah. you have that qualification. And, and there are a lot of opportunities. Traditionally, those skills were passed on at a factory level, so they weren't accredited courses. Um, and, you know, I've talked to the people that I worked with in the knitwear factory, for instance, the machinists there, and, you know, they, they started work at 14. And, you know, they just worked with someone and they were given various skills to learn and that's how they acquired the incredible hand skills that they've now got. And... Um, there are people that have joined that workforce because that particular factory has become busier and they're being trained in exactly the same way. So they're given, you know, very simple tasks to start off with and simple machines to operate. And so it is happening, but, you know, not, it's not a, certainly and, not a feature it was. And then there's a new set of skills. You know, the designers are no longer necessarily set up in an atelier. They're actually working on a computer. So you have a whole set of new software skills. And if you're using, like, particular knitting machines, you need a data programmer. So you're actually not looking at classic machinists and whatever. There's a whole other set of skills and 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 um, opportunities for people. So that's also where the industry has shifted quite a lot. People that do the four-year design degree, um, they will often go off and, and become a designer. So you'll get a percentage of those, like uh, recent graduates, you know, designing uh, we, um, evening wear for Calvin Klein in New York. You know, so we have, we have um, graduates who will go and they'll work internationally as well as in Australia. We have all the junior designers at Country Road, uh, Mimco, so on. They've all come out of 
that particular degree. But you'll get others who actually have set up successful fashion blogs. You've got others who will be working um, um, as, as a manager within a fashion company. There's a lot of different... So when you do fashion design, it doesn't mean you'll end up being a fashion designer. There'll be, you know, maybe 5% that that's what they'll end up doing. But the actual knowledge that you glean from being in a fashion design degree will give you opportunities within the fashion industry at a whole range of different levels. Some, some do actually enter the, that, this fashion design program uh, because they have a love for making things. Um, and they do, um, they, they might find during that time that they really are passionate about pattern making so they pursue a career in pattern making which again um, is uh, you know the, the industry's saying oh we can't get good pattern makers these days um, uh, some will go out and start their own um, small fashion atelier which might be grounded in in their own machining and pattern making um, as a basis for design so there's they kind of go off in all different directions, but but some of them are actually quite tech technically minded, and they do um, take that and and build their career on that. So unlike a lot of international courses at RMIT, you design and make. So you'll find in a lot of uh, design fashion design courses internationally, often the making you give to someone else to do. So that's the difference. So in fact, technically, you have those abilities. And as Mick was saying, some people might excel at that. You could go off and be in charge of you know, pattern making at Scanlon Theodore. Um, and that's a pretty amazing job to have. Um, or you could go on and do other things. But that is the difference in that course. So some design degrees don't put that emphasis on design and making. I sourced my kangaroo leather from um, a tannery in Queensland. I don't know the source of their raw materials. I don't know whether it's culling or farmed or what, um, or byproduct of meat production. Um, the hide on the kangaroo hide, the tail isn't there. The tails are sold separately because it's a much tougher leather. It's slightly scaly. Um, but I use pretty much the whole hide other than the tail. Um, some parts are softer or, or more pliable and more stretchy, which are suitable for some parts of the saddle. So I use, I'd probably use about 90 to 95% of the skin. To this practice, I'm applying a range of skills. Um, Pattern making is one of them. Um, but I learnt, I, I, I learnt leather work at home. Um, I had creative parents, textile artists and so on. Kind of, they were into crafts. <laughs> um, uh, and, and as a, a university student in my um, summer holidays, I worked in a small belt um, I wouldn't call it a factory, a workshop where, where we produce belts in small quantities for some of Melbourne's um, retailers. So we did Country Road and Jag and... Was um, that Brown Owl? Sorry? Was that Brown Owl? No. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, a few other brands that aren't around anymore, but he's still around. He's, he's doing belts for Scanlon and Theodore and Willow and, and that was all very much hands-on work. It might be to do with this fast cycle of fashion um, uh, that, you know, it's a... Well, I don't even know if it's a six-month cycle anymore. I'm not really involved in retail, but um, it, it could be weeks. a product of this it, turnover. It's two oh. weeks at Zara. There, there yeah. you go. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, I think I think the interesting thing about production is that, that fashion has used it in, in, in uh, another way in terms of something like quantifying something like couture by saying it has 200,000 hours of work instilled in the embroidery and whatever. I think it's more about the respect for the making process. I mean, you can get incredible, incredible workmanship out of particular types of machinery coming out of specific factories that can only do certain. So I think it's also um, 
getting people to just observe. I mean, most fashion people, you know, you like, we are talking before about online and going into retail, you like to touch something, you pick it up, you look at it, you observe, you suddenly notice, look how that collar sits, I wonder how they did that or whatever. So it's really trying to work out ways to get people going into that, that observation and you really start to appreciate because I think once, once you, fashion gets, labours this thing between fast and, and, and you know, um, taking a long time. There are some extraordinary things that you can do with a 3D printer that, you know, that, that's fast, but there's a lot of design that's gone into that. Or like um, a Shima Seiki knitting machine that does a whole garment. That can produce you a full garment in, you know, 10 minutes. But the, the design thinking that's gone towards that creation is extraordinary. So. I think, I think this is where, in terms, it's really getting to really think about the type of production and appreciating the thinking behind the production. That would, that would be my observation on and that. And I, I would just add to that that it's not just happening in fashion, it's happening across mm. the board. And the slow food movement is a really good example of people wanting to know where things have been produced, how they've been produced, caring about the process, being prepared for things to take a bit longer and being prepared to spend a bit more money. Um, we're just starting to see that now in the fashion industry, um, but it's not just in the fashion industry. Provenance and storytelling are important in all products. I mean, there's a there's a blogger, a marketing blogger from the US called Sarah Doody, and she's written it's a great name. She's um, she's written a, a piece about how important it is that to have storytellers involved at the beginning of the of the life cycle of a product because there is so much that people need to understand to appreciate a product, and often we just jump from you know, there it is. So, you know, mm. we don't have any understanding of what it went behind it. So it's incredibly important that those stories are told, that people uh, are informed. And, you know, that's been one of my roles is to actually help people to understand what goes into a product. Um, and, and it's something that I do at retail all the time. Is talk, I don't talk about, wow, that looks great. I talk about what's actually in that product or about the, the career of the person that made it. And those kind of the, the things that people would see sometimes as, traditionally as peripheral issues, but they're actually really important to how that product came to be. I, um, I was talking to Alistair the other day and I mentioned that I kind of shy away from calling my work a product. Um, and I have slipped up once or twice, but... Um, <laughs> uh, so, I, I mean, I don't really know what I call it, but what, what it is... <laughs> To me, it's, a, it's just about making stuff and, and I think that there's people out there that like to make things and it's not about making a product um, and it's just fantastic that some people like it and want to buy it and then maybe one day you can make a living out of it. Um, so it's, it's not just, it's not about being precious about, you know, this is handmade or this is the number of hours of work that's gone into it. It's just that it's being given that license to do something that you really love doing. It is to do with being able to click a button and you've got it. Um, it's interesting, um, just reflecting on my client base, um, mostly male, um, probably uh, 35 plus, 50, 45, 50. Um, I've got a waiting list of about a year now and, and I'm getting constant inquiries and, and I'm kind of apologetic when I tell them how long the wait list is um, and I think, you know, that, oh, they're not going to want to wait that long but they do and they, they're quite happy and they, all, they often say, you know, it's worth waiting that long and sometimes they think that that's actually a short waiting list. But um, maybe not from the generation you're talking about. I think it'll probably be um, some, well, not disaster, but um, I think it's kind of, you know, there's some impending kind of environmental dilemmas that we're going to face that will probably help to slow things down a bit. And I think, you know, we're at a, you know, fast fashion is just a, another example of, an, you know, instant access to things is just another example of our own overinflated sense of power over over the environment and over resources and all those sort of things and i think that you know what would be really great for us if is if the, all those cycles could slow down 
because then our cycles of consumption would slow down and, and therefore our, you know, our pollution and all those, all those other issues would also, um, you know, abate somewhat. And so perhaps it'll be, you know, realising that we're, you know, that the world we live in isn't going to be able to come up with infinite resources for us that will help to change people's habits. But hopefully we don't have to have our backs completely to the wall to, to make that change. Um, I would just say that it's it's partly about desire. <laughs> so it's what people want and it's giving them the option to want something that's also good for the community and good for the environment and good for others. So the more options that consumers have, hopefully, the more of them will choose the one that's better for other people. Um, that's a bit of a utopian view, but... That's what I would say. It's starting to be borne out, though. There's, there, yeah. I was reading Australian Food News last week, and, and they were they were there was an article there about how, um, you know, if you present consumers with a couple of options, and one of them is a sustainable option, more of them will choose the, the sustainable option now. So, you know, I think it's. And there was also an important piece of Roy Morgan um, research um, along the similar lines very recently as well. So I, I think it's starting to show up. It just takes a while to filter through. And also, if, 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 you, if you rethink the advantages of technology, that you can, you can produce on demand. So you don't, you don't produce vast quantities, units of a particular item, that if you can actually have your fast fashion, you order it and it's produced on that order, that again would also really change the landscape drastically. The technology is there for that to happen. So again, it's just looking at how that evolves. So for many of us who dwell in the land of thinking artisanal will answer all these issues to do with, with fashion system, that's not what tonight's about. It's looking at some of the issue, so, some of the practices that, that happen here in Melbourne. But also what I want to just remind people is there is the capacity for new technologies to actually also address some of the, the issues facing fa the fashion industry today. I could throw a slammer out there and say fashion is a really conservative industry when you think of cardigans, skirts, dresses and so on in terms of, 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 looking, of looking at, you know, how fashion evolves. I mean, where, where fashion will go will be really thinking at environmental issues, that, that that will become something that people will not have a choice over in terms of what we actually can sustain. So that there is, there, there is the signs of that in terms of... Uh, what production is actually doing to the fashion landscape. Um, I'll turn it to these people and I'll return to me in a moment. Um, what Just one comment I would make is that a lot of the big brands, they go to blogs to see what people on the street are wearing to get their inspiration. <laughs> so it's actually the users, it's the wearers, it's you know you that are driving the fashion industry in many ways. So um, the fashion industry, you know, as Robin was saying, they, they follow what we want. So what we want dictates <laughs> what they'll make in a lot of ways. For the most part, it's a business, so it has to make a profit and so it has to know what people want. So, you know, if it can directly access people, that's good market research. That's the very nature of fashion. Yeah. So fashion has always been like that. So we can't fight the beast. We're talking fashion, not clothing. Do you need fashion? I mean, we go back to that, you know, do you really need fashion? Probably not. But, you know, people will have that desire to be part of that. And there are lots of things that culturally it brings people together. There are all sorts of good things we can read out of fashion. Um, there are lots of other industries we can look at and look at similar things. We could talk about cars till, you know, forever. Um, so, so I think in terms of really looking at the potential of where fashion goes in terms of... I mean, there are some interesting, the interesting research happening in terms of well-being... And, and design is becoming much more aware and big companies becoming much more aware that fashion can work on other levels in terms of what material can do, in terms of the actual fabric against your skin. So a lot of the research is happening in, in textile technology. That's where the major research happens. Fashion itself is quite conservative in terms of where it sort of picks up on new things. That's where a lot of designers move to 
are sportswear because there you have these very high technologies and really working with very different understandings of how you mould a garment. So there's moulding happening in sportswear that has also impacted on fashion and also in, in fabric that can breathe. You know, it can keep you warm and it can also cool you down. So that's where you're getting interesting things. So a lot of the future of fashion will look at garments that perhaps can do more for you. So it won't just be a cardigan, it'll be something that can do much more for you. And I think in terms of as we address the idea of this overconsumption production, there'll be much more thought going into that. All you've got to do is look at designers like, you know, Hussein Shalain working in, a Puma, in Puma. You see those sorts of crossovers are very good for fashion because they get access to a whole range of technology that can then come into the more mainstream collections. So I think that's where, the, and they are companies that are spending a lot of money in research, and that is where fashion can actually grow in very interesting ways. It's very eclectic. I wish that I could say we had this sort of perfect target market and mm -hmm. we did all of this perfect market research that perfectly ma matched our target market, but it's much more small scale and eclectic than that. So it depends who walks in and off the street on Smith Street <laughs> on any given day. Young people, older people. We try to design for a range of body types to fit across a range of body types. We try to design pieces that are signature pieces that anyone would want to wear out to something special and also pieces that will last a long time. I think it's really interesting, you know, you generally when you think of people being experimental with their clothes, you tend to sort of generalise and put those into a younger bracket, you know, classically 16 to 25. But what I find really interesting and I've found over the last 10 years is that some of the most expressive people are women over 50. You know, so they're in control of their money, they know what they want to look like, they're not afraid of being judged by anyone, and they're fantastic customers, they really are. I mean, obviously they've got a, they've got a reasonable level of disposable income, meaning that, you know, over and above the things that they have to have, they've got some other money that they can spend on things. So with Five Burrows, um, our average consumer, it's 80% female, and uh, she is probably between 30 and 45, but you know we've got vast numbers either side of that, but, but that's where the biggest pocket of customers is. Okay, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. I'd also like you to put your hands together to thank our panelists, Mick Peel, uh, Grace McQuilton, Alastair McKinnon, also the... <laughs> Also, the incredible venue, the Toffin Town, City of Melbourne's Melbourne Conversations, uh, Jeff Taylor and Bianca Charleston, um, and I'll put in the ad now, to receive invites to Toff Talks, join Melbourne Conversations on Facebook and subscribe to Melbourne Conversations e-newsletters. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>